Hi guys, so for today's video, I'm going to introduce you to some of the um, some basic drawing materials. There are so many out there, and honestly, I'm still sometimes even discovering new ones daily. Um, maybe not daily, but there are quite a few art materials out there, especially for drawing. So we're going to go over some of the basic ones that I think I would recommend for you to have. Um, and then we were going to talk about shading and different ways on how to develop your mark making. Okay, so let's get started are all the materials that I would suggest you start with, okay? So we have the number two pencil that I used for last video. This is still a really great pencil, and I'm actually gonna show you the equivalence of this pencil within drawing pencils. So you have drawing pencils, and as you can see, they don't come with erasers, okay? Because erasers are always separate within drawing. They come, there's a huge range of these, okay? This is just kind of, I would say, probably the bare minimum that you wanna have. Sometimes you can get them in a box as a whole assortment, okay? And you can see that they're all individually labeled, right? So they're labeled, so you can kind of see this, right? Here's a 6B, 4B, B, 2B, 2H, and an HB, okay? So the B in these, letter, in these pencils, the B stands for black. The higher this number is, that means the darker the pencil is gonna be. So a 6B is darker than a 4B. A 4B is darker than a 2B, okay? And then a 2B is darker than a B. And they even have higher ones than that, okay? An H stands for hard. So these pencils, yes, they're lighter, but they're also harder. Meaning when you're using these on a piece of paper, they're also gonna really press down and make an imprint, um, depending again on the pressure that you're putting with that pencil on your paper. So it's really, you're gonna have to get a strike a balance of knowing which pencils to use. HB, which is this pencil right here, HB, this is actually the exact same thing as your number two pencil. So an HB pencil or a number two pencil are absolutely identical, okay? So if you ever, and what's nice, the reason I said you told you to use a number two pencil for the last video is because an HB pencil is like right there, right there in the middle, okay? So it's not too dark, it's not too soft, and it's also not too hard and won't put too much pressure on the paper. So if you're not sure which pencils to use, in the beginning, I would always say an HB or even just a regular B pencil, okay? You never want to start with a 6B. A 6B is very dark, right? And if you remember from the first video, how I told you, you always want to make your initial lines very light. So you don't want to start with a 6B. You also don't want to start with a, a very hard pencil like a 2H. Even though you think, oh, well, if I use a really light pencil, my lines will be really light. That is correct, but at the same time, you're gonna have to really have good control with this pencil to ensure that it doesn't press down. And I'm gonna show you what I mean by that. So let's say you're drawing something, and I'm just gonna draw a bunch of lines right here, okay? And I put a good amount of pressure with my pencil, so I just drew three lines. And let's say down the road you don't want these and you're gonna erase them. But let's say you don't need those lines, but then you are going to shade over this. Even though these lines are pretty much gone, if I take a soft pencil like a 6B and I go over them, these three lines will still kind of come through and they're going to make these white line marks, which hopefully I'm going to see if you can actually see it. Move these materials out of the way. To kind of zoom in a little bit but you can see just barely but you can see where those three lines that I initially made are still in there because when I put my pencil over the paper it wasn't able to get into the grooves that that hard pencil made okay so that is your drawing pencils you're going to get used to them just like everything else and learning which one to use but in the beginning like I said you're going to start the HB pencil a B pencil okay so these are your pencils Next thing comes with is sharpeners, right? Because you gotta sharpen these. Regular pencils, if you have an electric pencil sharpener, great, use it, you can absolutely do that. If not, you just, oh, you can then have a manual sharpener. But you need to have some form, something that can sharpen your pencils because a dull pencil is never, there's no effect that looks good with a dull pencil. So you just need to get in the habit of always sharpening your pencils, okay? So if you don't wanna get up, have something nearby that you can use, even if it's a manual one. Next comes erasers. So the first eraser is the kind of classic white eraser called plastic erasers, rubber erasers, whatever you want to call them. 
the I like these ones in particular, these little kind of white um, vinyl ones. Now, when you use these kinds of erasers, think of these for big mistakes. So a real, like you've worked on your drawing, you have a lot of extra lines you need to get rid of, now you fix it, things like that, and you want to get rid of some of those marks. So to do that, I want you to use this eraser, because when you use this kind of an eraser, you, you get all of these kind of crumb pieces from the eraser, right? Because when you are erasing, part of the eraser is also coming off, right? And then you want to make sure you always just kind of clean off the eraser so you don't smudge it. I mean, it's kind of a little bit of a mess, things like that. Now the crucial eraser you're going to want to invest in is this, and it's called a kneaded eraser. Just like when you knead bread, right, so K-N-E-A-D, it's called a kneaded eraser. It kind of feels like Play-Doh, like you can see it stretches, it folds and molds. You can shape it into different things, so you could shape this to have a really nice point, right? If you need to erase something, you can shape it in different ways. What's nice about this eraser is that it absorbs. There's going to be no dust and crumbs that kind of fall off from this kind of an eraser. It's going to absorb everything inside of it. Meaning that when this eraser is done, it's because it gets really tiny and there's nothing left. This eraser is never actually going to change in size. Instead, it's going to get really hard because it's going to, it would have absorbed all of that graphite from their pencil. And the other thing it's going to absorb is the oil from your hands. So even though it feels like Play-Doh, try not to get in the habit of holding this in your hands and just constantly playing with it. Because all you're doing is having this eraser absorb all the oil that's coming from your skin and your fingers. And then it's not going to be as useful. And then you're going to have to throw it away and get a new one. So why would you use this eraser? This eraser works by picking up that top layer. So let's say I made this area right here that's really dark, but I just wanna lighten it a little bit. So I can kind of flatten my eraser right here, and I can go in and just lightly push down, and it creates that nice subtle effect. So I didn't go in there and make these harsh lines, because this is pretty harsh, right? If I went through here, that's a pretty harsh line that I'm erasing. But instead, this gives that subtlety. The other nice thing you can do is different effects with it. So let me make another little area where I can show you. So let's say you wanted to make a bunch of little dots, and then the dots are going to be white. So rather than trying to draw all around these little dots, I can make my eraser into this little point, and I can kind of just dab the eraser down on the surface to create those effects. You can do the same thing with lines. So I can flatten the eraser so it's nice and flat here, go through, and create much more controlled lines. Because here I can actually shape them into the width that I want. With this we can't, right? We're limited to the size that it is. Very, very useful tool. But again, remember from what I said in the beginning, when you're starting, you're drawing uh, just when you're trying any kind of drawing. Don't get too obsessed with using your eraser to fix mistakes because erasing does take up time and you wanna focus more of your time on refining your drawing. So the beginning stages of any, any drawing, no matter how advanced or fundamental it is, you wanna spend a lot of time drawing first and then kind of go back and actually use your erasers. But both of these are very, very important. Next thing is gonna be your blending sticks. I actually don't really use these. I'm not the biggest fan of them. I know some people who will say that this is even more important than an eraser. It's totally up to you. I'm an advocate of learning how to blend using just your pencil and just control of your hand. I think that is much more beneficial and I think it's much more important than using this tool. With that said though, this is a really amazing tool for small detail work. People that do portraiture, they'll use it a lot. This is, even though this is a large blending stick, you don't want to use this to blend a large area. You just don't. It's not going to look very good. It looks very smudgy. The other thing that happens is that whenever you use these, let's say I'm going to show you in a second, I'm going to blend this area. It's going to appear darker than it actually started because it's really going to blend all that graphite together. Right now, there's a lot of these little grooves that are showing the paper through. I personally like that. I don't mind showing that my drawing looks like a drawing. I'm not trying to mask it and pull it off as photography, but some people want that. Some people really want their drawings to be, like to almost fool the eye and look like it was a photograph. And so maybe for them, these kinds of tools would be more beneficial and they'll enjoy them. And this is just paper. It's actually just made out of paper. So it's 
like a paper towel to, to blend things. You can always use that, a paper towel to blend things. This is just paper. When it gets really dark, you just peel this off and you get a, have a new little point on there. And you use it just like you think you would. You just go over an area and it blends it all together. But you can see that got really dark. So if you, you, you have to keep that in mind if you're ever going to use this, right? And then if you're ever going to use this again, you can see here it's really dark, just like you'd want to clean up an eraser right here, right? Because if I use this right now, it would create a mark somewhere. Same with this blending stick. If I, even if I just did it on the blank piece of paper right there, it's creating a little bit of a smudge. Good tools to try out for sure. I would not recommend using these in the beginning stages of your drawing experience, I guess or you can call it. Just because if you rely too heavily on this, you'll never actually get good at blending on your own with just pencils. So don't have, overly rely on these guys, just like you don't want to over rely on erasers. But it's a good, good tool to have. Next is charcoal. So with charcoal, there are block charcoal. And charcoal comes in a ton of different varieties, just like the pencils do in terms of their softness, hardness, darkness, things like that. Same with charcoal. It also comes in different colors. I'm not going to go into that right now. But what's really nice with charcoal, especially in the beginning, as you can see, like a stick charcoal, piece of uh, charcoal, it doesn't give, it doesn't allow you to have as much precision as a pencil would. So why would you not want precision? Well, if in the beginning, if you are kind of overly paranoid, you're constantly working on the details and you can't train yourself to not do that, then try charcoal. Because here, it's almost impossible for you to do any detail work, right? Because you have this little kind of block. And so all you can do is just create basic lines, shapes. It's going to be a lot more messy. Your fingers are going to get dark. So you're always going to have a paper towel nearby. But what's nice with charcoal is you can also blend with your finger. I didn't mention this earlier. You do not want to blend pencil with your finger. This is something that for some reason has never just gone away and people still do this. Never blend pencil with your finger. One, I personally just don't think it looks good. I think you can just always tell when someone blends with their finger. If you're really going to want to do that, like get that effect, use an actual tool like this. The reason you don't want to blend with your finger is the same reason you don't want to play with this eraser. Your fingers have oils in them. And those oils do not work well with graphite. They, one, they don't mix very well. But two, this paper is porous. So it has all these little grooves that when you use your pencil, that graphite goes into all those grooves. When you use an eraser, it goes into those grooves and picks up that graphite. Or in this case, it absorbs that graphite. When you introduce something like oil, it traps all of that pigment in those pores of the paper, and it makes it much harder for you to fix anything or add anything on top. So just trust me when I say don't blend pencil with your finger. Charcoal on the other hand, you can. It's a different material and it responds better to it. There are also charcoal pencils that again come in a wide variety like regular pencils. So you can use them the same way. You can see obviously it's much darker. It's a much different effect. Most people, they'll know immediately whether they like charcoal or not. I recommend trying everything in the beginning. Usually you won't use both in a drawing. You're not gonna use graphite and charcoal, but at least you try. So all those beginning exercises we did with just a number two pencil, try all of them with charcoal and see how they work. Like I said, there's also different colors of charcoal, like including white. So you're thinking, well, how am I gonna show you on this paper? There's also different paper, obviously out there. And for charcoal, there's also different colored charcoal paper. So then you could do a drawing, dark paper with white charcoal. And you can see that contrast looks really nice. So there's a lot of surfaces that you can work on. You don't always have to start with a white surface. And there's a lot of materials that you can work with. So next, I'm going to show you different ways of shading. So now, before we talk about shading, I want to talk about suggestive lines, which is actually a type of shading. So let's say we have these basic shapes, right? So the same thing, because you, when you start drawing, we talked about observational drawing and breaking down what you see into basic shapes. Let's say whatever you're drawing is made up of an assortment of different shapes, potentially including these. And then you want to actually add value to them. Value is the range from dark to light. Everything has it. Everything in this world in existence has a range 
of darks to lights. So when you're adding value, you're developing it. You're taking it more from just a contour drawing and you're making it look three-dimensional. And that is what shading does. Shading is the process, value is the result. Okay, so think about it that way. Value is what we're applying, but shading is what we're actually doing. So suggestive lines is one way that you can develop value. So we have, let's start with this circle. We have this circle here. If I wanted to turn the circle into a sphere, if I do this and just draw a bunch of lines going horizontally and then a bunch of lines going vertically, I have not transformed this into a sphere. This is still a flat circle. So if I want to take this and make this into a sphere, which we're going to do right here, the circle again. I want to make these lines curved because this is a curved object. So that's why it's called suggestive because I'm suggesting that this circle is rounded. So to do that, instead of making these straight lines, we're going to make them curved. And we're going to start in the middle. Think of this almost like a, if you think like a, any kind of sports ball, a basketball. You can see they're starting at the top and they're ending at the bottom. I'm not going all the way down. And then I'm going to do the same thing across, having them be curved. This is how a lot of globes that you might see in classrooms, how they look. I'm actually kind of messed up here. This one should have connected. But you get the idea. The horizontal ones are a little, they can go a little differently. Okay. You can see here, this bottom one clearly looks much more rounded than this top one. This kind of looks like a flat pancake. This one is starting to have some form. Now you don't have to do it like these perfect lines like I was showing you. Okay, back to our circle. And I'm using a B pencil here during all of these exercises. here I'm just doing a ton of different lines but they're all curved so again this looks round this looks round they look like a round sphere but these do not because they use flat lines so this is what suggestive lines means is when you're filling an object up even if you have no idea how to shade if the lines that you add mimic the shape itself then you're going to create that illusion that it's three-dimensional and that it's the shape that it's supposed to be. So then let's work on these three shapes. So first thing, the square, we're going to transform that into a cube. We're going to talk about how to make things 3D in terms of perspective later on. So right now, just don't really worry about that. So we have our cube. We don't really need to worry about the front of the cube, but let's say the side of it. Here, I'm going to make a bunch of these angled lines. We'll do the same thing on the top. Because these angled lines are going in the same direction as this angle, that is giving that suggestion that it kind of goes in the back, that it goes this way. So let's try and take this triangle, transform that into a cone. So then I'm going to round the bottom a little bit. Now, if I was going to make this like a see-through cone, then I could obviously do another circle here. And then I could do another circle on the bottom to show that. This is kind of like you would probably remember from geometry class. But if you wanted to just do lines to give that illusion that it's 3D, just pick one side. I'll pick here on the right. And I'm just going to do these lines, but then as I turn on the cone, they're going to get less and less and become lighter. And that gives that illusion that this cone is darker on one side, and then it goes and gets lighter, which gives it that 3D form. This rectangle, let's turn that into a um, cylinder. forgot the word for that. So remember this ellipse, right? 
And this is going to be, again, similar to this cone, where I'm going to go dark. But instead of going up like this, because this is rounded, similar to this, the spheres, I'm going to start here, and I'm going to make these rounded lines. And I'm picking up my pencil right here. That's how I'm getting that light effect. And then when I've done that, I can go over it again a little bit with some of these vertical ones because I've created already a little bit more suggestion. You can do the same thing on the top. That gives it a little bit more form. So this is called suggestive lines. But you can see here I started doing this where I started overlapping lines. Overlapping lines is called cross hatching, which essentially is what cheating is. You're cross hatching. Whenever you're filling in a shape, you're not going to be going in the exact same direction the entire time. If you are, then your lines are visible. So if I constantly shade, and I want you to take a look at how I'm shading. If you saw in the beginning, I held my pencil like this. I held it like this when I was drawing. When I just started shading, I went, my hand went all, went all the way back here. Your hand may as well. You have to constantly readjust how you're holding the pencil because each one of these different techniques requires different control of your hand. So shading in one direction. And although this looks pretty smooth right now, right, you are gonna at some point need to change directions and go in a different direction. The more directions you go, the less lines you can see, and that's what gives that amazing photo finish. Because when someone looks at it, they know you used a pencil, but they can't identify any of these lines. And when they can't identify it, that's what creates that really cool effect that it looks almost like a photograph. Because they can't understand where, where are the pencil lines, where was the pencil ever. So I went in this direction, now I'm going to go in an opposite direction. And each time you do this, whatever you are applying value to, it's going to keep getting darker, obviously, because you're building up value over and over and over again. And you just keep doing that. This looks really nice right now and seamless because I'm using the side of my pencil, which I'm going to go over more in detail in a second. But just to explain to you what cross hatching is, think of it as making a m many lines in one direction, then making many lines in another direction. And then you just keep changing directions until none of your lines are visible. Obviously doing it like this is gonna take you much longer than what I just did. That's why it's important to use the side of the pencil, which you're gonna go over next. So try right now to draw some of these basic shapes and transform them into 3D shapes using suggestive lines. And then maybe in a little area on your paper, try some of these cross hatching techniques. So now we're going to practice our shaping abilities. This exercise, I will admit, is not the most exciting because you're going to be making tonal bars. A tonal bar is a way it sounds like a bar where you're going to progress from dark to light and it's going to teach you how to control that application of value. Just like those beginning exercises that we did in the first video just taught you basic control of your hand, this is the same thing, but now you're going to learn how to control things so they go darker and lighter. I want you to start with three pencils, a B, a 2H, and a 4B. I recommend starting with the B first, then probably going to your 4B, and then ending with your 2H. 2H tends to be a little bit more of a tricky one. If you don't have these three, that doesn't matter. All you really want to do is pick something in the middle, so like a B or an HB, and then pick something on the opposite side. So something in the middle of the darker Bs and something in the middle of the light Hs. And what you're going to do is you're going to draw a rectangle don't overthink it. You don't want this to be too small, but you also don't want this to be way too big. This is a pretty good size. And so this is going to be my B tonal bar. And my goal is to progress from dark to light. And you don't want to just do this like right away, put a lot of pressure down your pencil to make it really, really dark, and then try to pick your pencil up and make it really light. Could you do it? Sure. But I'd rather you learn how to build up the value. 
because whenever you're drawing, you never want to start with the darkest value, just like you never want to start with the darkest pencil. You can always make things darker. Remember that you can always make things darker, but these erasers, you don't want to rely on those because even if you go really dark, no matter what eraser you have, it's not going to look the greatest if you have to erase really, really dark areas but you can always make things darker. So just remember that. So what you're gonna do is use the side of your pencil. The reason you're gonna use the side is because there's more area there that you can apply on the paper. If you're just gonna use the tip of the pencil, that's more for detail, just like you would when you're writing. And typically when you're doing this, you are gonna have to change, like I said, the position of how you're holding the pencil. This is where I tend to have my pointer finger kind of lay on top of the pencil because I'm using that control and you're not going to be going from your wrist. This is really where drawing from your arm is going to be important. Certain places you may start with your wrist, but then you may have to adjust. You're also going to have to adjust how you're moving along. You're not really going to be able to be in the same position the entire time because your range of motion is going to be really limited. And before you start, what I recommend that you do is that you create a little tick mark for yourself in the middle just so you know where that is, and then on either sides. Okay, from there, I'm gonna start at one of my corners. Like some, this is gonna be the darkest area, but it's not gonna start at the darkest. I'm gonna start at one of my corners, and I'm doing kind of like these little loops. Small little loops. And I'm just putting light pressure down and I'm extending all the way across and now that I've gone almost to the middle I'm telling myself okay I need to go lighter so I'm going to try to pick up the pressure off my pencil and go even lighter so by the time I get to this next tick mark there's almost nothing there let me just pick up my pencil it's important that you do, every time you do a layer, you go from the beginning all the way to the end. If you stop at any point, then you're gonna get these seams in your tunnel bar or in your value when you're shading any in your drawing that aren't gonna look natural. And then you're gonna basically create a suggestive line that you didn't wanna have. So it's really important that as you're doing this, this is why I like to say start at the corner and go at these angles. Because when you're going at an angle, you have a wider range of motion than if you were just to start going up and down, which we are going to do. So next, I'm going to go at this corner. And I can actually apply the exact same amount of pressure because it's going to get darker no matter what. Because obviously I'm applying another layer of graphite. And if you go outside the square like I just did there, don't worry about it. You want to go as close inside of it as you can, but that's not our goal too much. So now, okay, I got to the middle. And I'm going to get lighter and lighter. Basically disappear. You want this to almost stay white, but you don't want it just to cut off and become white. So that's why I'm slowly kind of just picking up my pencil here. So now I'm going to go up and down and go all the way across. What's nice though is I've already built up this foundation for myself. So now that I have this foundation, I'm going to start putting a little bit more pressure on the pencil. And then now, since I've gone this direction, this direction, and this way, I'm gonna start again from the top. And now I'm gonna really control. Now I wanna really try to make this area darker. And as I move to the right, I'm gonna consciously pick up my pencil. Like right now, I'm putting a pretty good amount of pressure on my pencil. And now that I got to that first tick mark, okay, I'm gonna to start to lighten up a little bit. really going to lighten up. And then I'm going to stop. I'm going to try a little bit, see if I can get this any darker. And 
and I'm going to fade lightly out. So by doing this, what this shows me, this is the darkest that my B can get. So if I'm using a B pencil, this is the darkest I can get. If I want it to be darker, you're going to have to use a darker pencil. But what this shows me is the range of value that a B pencil can do. So it can, it's really great for you can see for that middle section. It's not the best for really dark areas. For light ones, sure, they're all kind of really good, really light ones. I can get, to, I have the control to fade to that part. So now I'm going to go ahead and do the same thing with the next two pencils. Okay, so now you can see I have my three tonal bars, my B, my 4B, and my 2H. Just looking at these, you can see clearly that the 4B is much darker, and it's really great for those dark values. Not the greatest for the light ones, because no matter what, it kind of makes those lines when you fade out. But the B and the 2B are really great, that little faded area. 2H, not the best for when you're trying to go really dark, because it's almost impossible to get rid of those lines. This is where that needed eraser will really come into play. You can see here, I kind of bled out of my little squares a little bit. That's totally okay. I was trying not to move the sketchbook, but you can absolutely move the sketchbook as you're working along. Just like if you were drawing, you can move your drawing to make it a little more comfortable. You don't want to go too far out of them, but the main point is you don't want to get smaller. Some people, when they're working on these tonal bars, I'll see them working, working, and it kind of just turns into this like a little funnel. So you don't want to do that either. So pick three pencils and practice doing this. The biggest thing is you want to see that progression. So it shouldn't be a bar that looks identical from one end to the next. It should be darker. There should be some form of a transition that then gets lighter. Okay, guys. So now I'm going to show you how to apply value onto an object so you can actually develop it. I'm starting off with my B pencil. I have a circle drawn here and I did just the basic ground lines back here just to ground it so it shows that it's actually sitting on something. And then we're going to add value here. Now, where are we going to add the value? Because right now, I'm actually not looking at an object. If you're looking at an object, then you would look at it and, in real life and see, okay, where is it lighter? Where is it darker? But when it's like this, then you're just going to, like it's make-believe in a way, you are going to decide where's the light source. So let's say our light source is up here. We'll draw a little sun. Wherever the light source is, directly, like the first the closest area to it, that will be the lightest area, which makes sense. That's where the sun is hitting it. The darkest area is going to be directly opposite from here. So it will be right there. And this is actually where you want to start because this is, think of this as like a tonal bar. So you're going to start here and build up that value so it disappears once it gets here. So it'll be much darker here and then it'll get lighter. And the shadow, which is cast back here, if you think about it, when the sun hits something, the shadow goes this way. So the shadow is going to grow from that dark area as well. So it'll be dark here and then it'll disappear when it comes out here. You don't want to start by drawing an outline where the shadow is. The reason you don't want to do that is typically when people do that, their mind thinks they need to fill in that entire shape and then the shadow just looks very artificial. Remember, a shadow is just light. We don't act, we can't pick it up. And so we, because we can't pick it up, it doesn't have any defining edges like objects would. So let's start. And I'm starting off by, instead of going up and down like I did with the tonal bar, I'm curving my line. Because again, it's a suggestive line. I'm 
Now I'm not going to worry too much about the messiness because I'm going to show you how to use your kneaded eraser here later. And then it's going to lightly just disappear. And then I don't want to go in different directions because I want all the darkness to come here. So instead I'm just going to shift a little bit. Curve around to make it lighter. Shift this way. Curve it around to make it a little bit lighter. Now I'm going to go back and really add some pressure here to make this much darker. And you can see now here, this edge line that I drew in the beginning has disappeared. And that's what you want. You don't want any of those cartoony lines in your drawing when you're once you've developed a value. All of your lines should blend into the value. Nothing in the real world has these artificial lines. That's kind of why it only exists in cartoon world. You can see it gets darker and then goes lighter. So you think, what about these lines? These are pretty dark. What am I supposed to do with those? So that is where this guy will come in. I'm going to go in and I'm just going to lightly touch on those lines. And then here I'm even erase it completely. I'm going to clean up my shape. So then I can go in when I'm doing the value and just lightly fill in that sphere. And here I'm going to have that line almost just completely disappear. And then here as well, I'm going to kind of clean up this edge right here, bring it up, and then almost have it completely disappear. Okay. And then I'll take my new eraser. I made it a little bit too dark just to clean it up. And you can see it was just very gentle, just very gentle lines. Because once you've built a foundation, you don't always have to start here. You can kind of come back in other places and touch it up. So here we have our lovely little sphere, and then now I'm going to work on that shadow, which again, directly here. And a shadow is always going to mimic the shape of the object, so it's going to be rounded. And then here as it comes out, it's going to disappear. Shadows are important, but also don't spend too much time focusing on them and not enough time on the object itself. And the shadow is always going to become slightly part of the object itself, but then here, right where the two meet, that's where you really want to make it much darker. So we have a little defining point just to show that the sphere is really sitting there. And then I'm going to immediately take that line and fade it out into the sphere. And slightly into the shadow. And if I still wanted to make the sphere a little bit darker, I could grab my 4B pencil. You can grab any darker pencil, it doesn't have to be a 4B, it could be a 2B. I would never jump to a 6B, or don't ever make drastic jumps. But I can use that to make this darker area of my sphere even more dark. Okay. And then if I wanted to, I can go in the back, add some more value back here to really refine the background. So for example, just to show that this is really light, Come here a little bit with the edge.
And then here, I definitely don't want it to become part of the sphere, so you just need to decide what you want it to be darker. And I'm going to make sure my sphere is a little bit darker. And you can go back with this over the background in multiple layers, right, so you don't, so it's nice and clean, not so visible. I'm going to leave it like that for right now. But then I can kind of go around here just to really, and I'm not going in with like the tip of the pencil making this really harsh line. I'm just lightly going in just to refine that edge so it doesn't, it doesn't look like my object is blending into the background. And then I'm lightly dragging these lines down so they blend in to the object. And then here I'm going to do the opposite with the background. And then if I really want to get a nice crisp edge right there, that's when you shape your kneaded eraser. And go in there, clean that up. And then you have a nice clean white edge. And then if that's too harsh of a separation from here to here, this is where you kind of flatten out your kneaded eraser and just lightly tap down. So that white part disappears into the pencil part. Okay, and there you have it. That's just kind of a basic value application onto a sphere with our lovely sun back there to show us where the light source is. So go ahead, try that out. Try it with just drawn objects like this, but then take all these techniques and actually apply it onto whatever you're drawing from real life.